Okay, we're going to get started now. This is Joe DeChara with Bedrock Bookkeepers Online Academy. And I'm happy that you're here. And this is part two of Do-It-Yourself Fundamentals of Bookkeeping and Business. And I'm going to get right into the, the course right now. Chapter six, we're going to talk about awesome paperless file systems. And we've been hearing about paperless file systems since they created the scanner. Okay, I remember it must have been over 10 years ago, one of my entrepreneurial endeavors was a scanning business. I was probably five years ahead of my time. It failed the software. I bought a $30,000 scanning machine and the software was was flawed. Anyway, I was actually getting clients. Uh, there was a need for it, but it was just a couple of years ahead of uh, its time. Now, today, that $30,000 scanner, we can do the same thing with a $100 printer. <laughs> so, you know, that was an expensive lesson. But the point is that in today's business world, if you're not doing things paperless, you're, you're missing the boat. And I'll tell you why. Small businesses especially, speed and efficiency are, are huge. Okay, the biggest hidden cost in a business is time. And that time doesn't show up on your P&L or on your tax return. So what we want to do here is create not only a paperless system, but a paperless system that's going to work to your benefit. Now, I'm going to tell you a short story. I get a lot of true stories because I've, I've worked directly or indirectly with thousands of small businesses, and I've seen a lot of horror stories. Okay, and this one was the biggest horror story when it came to scanning. Now, I mentioned this this one client last night in my class, not by coincidence, but it was just the way that this guy ran his business. Now, this was a large trucking company. They owned over 100 trucks. They were doing probably $10 million in business. So don't, don't assume because a business is large that, that they have their act together. In fact, what I found is the bigger the business, the more problems that they have. This one individual's real problem was with his ego. Okay, and so he thought everything he did, he thought he was a genius. And what he did was he bought a scanner, not the $30,000 kind of scanner, but he probably paid, you know, probably three or $4,000 for the scanner. It was about eight years ago. And what he did was he scanned everything. Now, in the trucking business, there is literally, he probably had, hundreds of documents every day because every part of a delivery, everything is documented. So what this guy did in all his wisdom was he scanned every document and then he shredded it, including the tax returns and financial statements that I gave him. So he was trying to sell the business, get financing. He eventually went bankrupt and it was because of the way he ran his business and the way he ran his business was the same way that he ran his scanning operation. So he shredded everything, including my tax returns, and I found it uh, odd and annoying when he kept asking me for copies of stuff that I had already given him. So I asked him, I said, Mike, why, I saw you scan this, why do you keep asking me for it? Not that I mind. I did mind, but I didn't want to tell him that. But, you know, I said, wouldn't it be faster if you just retrieved the document from your paperless file system? And his answer was he would, but he couldn't find it because he didn't name it. In other words, when you get software, you're, you're stuck with the default settings. And the default setting on this software named it some kind of arbitrary name. So he literally had hundreds of thousands of electronic paperless documents that he couldn't find any of them. 
don't do that. <laughs> so I'm going to show you how to go from this to this, okay, and run your business a lot more effectively. Just this one chapter, I believe, is, is worth the price that you paid for this course. So there's really only three steps to creating a, a good document system. Okay, obviously, you know, I skipped over, you got to have a scanner because, and, and this is a mistake, I shouldn't just assume that you have a scanner, but most printers today actually double as copy machines and scanners. If you don't have a scanner, I could recommend I have a nice little Fujitsu. It's a ScanSnap S1500. I bought it probably four years ago. And I scan everything. Any kind of paper document that comes my way, I scan it. It's high speed. It, it works. I've never had a problem with it. I think it costs 300 bucks. It's more than paid for itself. Uh, and there's plenty of other low-cost scanners out there. But so after I scan it, and I'm going to show you my whole procedure, what we do is we have to save it in the correct file format. Okay. There is a product out there called Neat. Okay. I do not recommend this for one reason. It, there's a huge learning curve. Okay. It likes to save documents in its own format. Okay. And it's 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 not efficient. Okay. You can do the same thing with a simple scanner. I'm going to show you how. So the file format is, I'm going to go through that, you have to create a logical naming convention. And I'm going to explain what, what that means. And also you have to save your documents in the cloud. Okay, the days of saving stuff on, on a hard drive are over. If you're still doing that, you have to get in, into this century because everything is in the cloud. You know, you might worry about security issues and, and stuff like that, but, you know, the fact of the matter is that you want to be nimble, you want to be efficient. I could run my accounting business with a cell phone and a laptop, okay? And that's the goal, you know, unless you have a brick-and-mortar business, you should be able to configure your business to, to do that. You know, I travel a lot and that I'm probably one of the few accountants that can actually go through tax season on the road. Okay, so let, let's get into the file formats. There's two that you may know. The PDF file format is the most prevalent. There is a free program called Adobe Reader that you can download for free if you're not familiar with PDF, uh, I'm, I'd be surprised. There is another file format that's called XPX, XPS that I use occasionally, and I don't even remember why or, or when, but sometimes I just say, and it's, it's, a, it's a nice format. I believe it's a Microsoft uh, extension, and it saves documents the same way as a PDF file. Okay, so that's the, the two different formats. So one of the ways you can save a file, some of these programs actually just let you save a file as a PDF file. Okay, but let's say you don't want to save the whole file. Let's say you only want to save a portion of it. What you can do is there's another version of Adobe that, I believe you have to pay for, I have Adobe Premiere, and it actually acts as a, as a printer, okay? So all you would do is, just like you were printing any other document, here's my other printers, so you would choose the Adobe printer and print it, and now what you can do is down here you can select whatever pages you want. Now you'll see over to the right of that on the bottom is the Microsoft XPS format. Okay, so they both work, they both work well, and that's the different formats. So 
let me show you my naming convention and this is how I do it and I could tell you I could f I have thousands of documents in my system and I can find any of those within 10 seconds maybe 30 seconds <laughs> but if it's a tax return like like this 10 seconds because I know exactly what the name is and and this is my format so you have to choose, you have to create a format that works with your business. So the first part of it is my client's name. And then I put a dot there to separate it. Okay. Then I have what tax form it is, another dot, and then the tax period. Okay. So in other words, this would be XYZ Corp, the 1120S form for 2014. This is huge because I get requests for all kinds of tax returns, not just corporate or personal, but payroll taxes. So you can imagine how many payroll tax forms there are. And in the olden days, you had to actually go to a paper file, and hopefully the, the paper documents were there. Accounting is totally different now and unfortunately there's still accountants that like to use paper and I don't work there <laughs> so these are the 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 software versions that I use I use two of them and reason being because originally so I use Dropbox and I use Google Drive so originally Google Drive didn't let you save every kind of format okay but I liked Google Drive because I do everything in Google I have my Gmail my calendar my documents I have my spreadsheets in there so it's seamless but for those other documents that at the time Google Drive didn't allow I was saving in Dropbox not the most efficient way to do it, but it was better than what I had in the beginning. Okay, now I actually save just about all my documents in both. Reason being that I don't really have a good reason, <laughs> other than maybe laziness. At some point, I'll probably just switch everything over to Google Drive. But I'm so used to the routine, and it only takes me really a couple of seconds to save it in, in both. In, in both systems okay so now let me show you how to actually print a document and it's pretty simple it's just like any other document you have the document open you go to print it now you'll see that I have my default printer up there the brother and then I just change it with this dialog, I change it to PDF. So you could see this document at this time was 56 pages. That's a lot of paper to print. So, you know, and I do print. <laughs> I don't want you to think that I never print anything. You know, for instance, I printed out this whole ebook. I even printed out the PowerPoint presentation. Okay. Now what I'm going to do with this paper is I'm probably going to shred it and throw it out because I don't keep paper. I am totally paperless as far as it goes. To, I don't keep any tax documents. I do have files, but in those files are usually permanent documents like certificates of incorporation, uh, agreements, just, just stuff that I'd like, I, I need to have the originals. Okay, so now the here's, okay, I save it. To, so once I print it, it asks me where, I'm not actually printing it on paper, I'm, I'm printing it to an electronic document. So you could see up here is my name and then it, it's in the Dropbox. So on the left side, you could see these are all my locations. So I could print it to anywhere. So I'm going to take you through one of my, my naming conventions here. So for this one, I am saving a bedrock file. So all of my bedrock 
documents start with bedrock so I can easily find it. So if I just want to find a bedrock document, I just type that in my search bar and they, they come up in an instant. Now the second part, this ebook was called Guide to Gaining Control of Your Books and Records. So that's the second part of it. Now the third part is I always date my documents. I always date them. Okay, just in case I just want to do a, a date sensitive search. This has come in handy a lot of times. So now this is the actual name of the save file. Bedrock, I put the period there. Guide to gaining control of your books and records. Dot, uh, dot the date and then whatever the file extension is. Okay, now finding it is pretty simple. In, when I'm in Google Drive and it's basically the same thing with Dropbox, all I got to do is I'm doing a search in here and I'm going to show you when I type in Bedrock, all of my Bedrock documents come up and that comes up within a second, literally. Okay, so that's chapter six. Okay, I believe that that information, if you weren't saving your documents electronically, if you didn't have a paperless file system, I highly recommend that you incorporate this into your system, and it is, it does become part of your books and records. That's part of your story. Now, if you ever get audited, and I'm going to cover this about electronic bookkeeping systems, you probably will have to print everything, unfortunately, if you have receipts. Oh, and by the way, yeah, this goes for your receipts also, not just your uh, documents. So, in other words, if there's a receipt, for instance, like a car repair bills, bills from Staples, all of those actual paper documents that I get, I scan them and do the same naming convention. So I would name it, let's say, tax receipt dot staples and then the date. Okay, and then I put it into a tax receipts folder which I which I date. Okay, so the my tax receipts for 2015 is named tax receipts. 2015. That's the folder I put it in. Okay, chapter 7. I want to talk a little bit about the con control and the privacy issue. Because th this, this is big when it comes to letting go of your bookkeeping. Not only letting go of it, but having somebody else uh, help you with it which is actually letting go of it, but also hiring an accountant, okay? What I found a long time ago that people didn't hire me because of my tax knowledge. That was important, but I think that, you know, just knowing that I was a CPA was enough for them. They just assumed that I knew everything that I needed to know to do a good job on their taxes. What what was the deciding factor was that I made them comfortable knowing that they can open up their lives to me. You know, I equate letting somebody look at your books as the same thing as letting a stranger look in your closet. Okay? Now, I'm a big reader. I'm an avid reader. I've read a lot of books. I continue to read books. And one of the books that I read years ago, probably 10 years ago, really changed the way I looked at my accounting business and my client's business. It was called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Dr. Stephen Covey. It's a hard read. It's not simple, but he said one thing in there that, that really turned me. And he said that People wind up in the thick of thin things. 
<laughs> okay? And that resonated with my accounting business because I was stuck in the middle of all of these little details. And that's what he was talking about. We get caught up in all of these little details. And if you want to grow a business, it's going to be very hard if you know every little detail of your business. You know, I have clients that proudly say, I know everything that's going on in my business. I know every little transaction, blah, blah, blah. And you want to know something? They're in charge of a very small business. And it has to, and most people never get over this hump. Okay, and it has nothing to do with business. It has everything to do with fear and control. Okay, so being in the thick of thin things does not allow people to grow a business. Okay, now if you want to be in control, that's a lot different than being controlling. You can be in control and not have your fingers on every little detail. You know, I use Larry Broughton a lot because he's in our mastermind and the guy is brilliant and the guy either owns or operates over 40 hotels. I doubt very much that he knows exactly what's going on every day in every one of those places. He's got his finger on the pulse of the business because he set up controls and he surrounded himself with the right people okay so bookkeeping is one of the for a small business you don't get to be a large business by being in control of everything okay but bookkeeping for a small business is one of the main if not the main culprit in in being in the thick of thin things. Okay. Another thing that happens is entrepreneurs get caught up in the QuickBooks syndrome. They believe falsely, my friend Marianne Amen calls this a false belief, that if they're entering everything in QuickBooks that somehow they're in control. And that's so far from the truth. Okay, so let me get caught up here. Okay, so if you go into this, and this is all mindset stuff, okay? So why are people afraid of not being in control or the false belief that they're going to be in control by knowing every little detail? Okay, the, the fear is that you're going to be judged. Uh, the fear is that people are going to see your private information. So I got a couple of suggestions to help you get over that fear. That fear that people are going to see everything about your private life. Okay, and one of them is to keep your personal information out of the business. It doesn't belong there. You should not be commingling your business transactions with your personal transactions. And there's a bunch of good reasons for that. Number one, if you ever get audited, and believe me, people are getting audited more than ever today. And it's not just the IRS. It's the state governments. It's the insurance companies. It's the banks. Anybody that has anything to do with your business can and will ask you to produce your books and records. So if you're going to Macy's or you're paying your kids college tuition and you get audited, that's going to raise all kinds of red flags. So what you want to do with your books and records is you want to draw a line between your business and your personal expenses. Okay, take a paycheck out of your business and deposit it into your personal account. Now, this might add a little bit of layers to, you know, it might be a pain in the neck sometimes. 
And believe me, I know that when you're running a small business, co-mingling, especially in the beginning, co-mingling is, is, there's no way around it sometimes. You know, if you're starting a brand new business and you're borrowing from Peter to pay Paul, the last thing you're thinking about is incorporating and setting up another bank account. Okay, so if you have this separation, there should be no fear about people looking at, at your personal stuff. The other reason is that if you commingle your personal information, it makes it a lot more difficult to do your accounting work. You know, I've had so many clients that thought that they were losing money, and when I looked and I started separating out the personal money that they were that they were filtering through their business I would show them and say you're making plenty of money here but you're paying your mortgage you're paying your wife's uh, car you're paying your, your grandfather's health insurance out of here once we take all of that out you know what you should be doing is taking a paycheck to cover those personal expenses keep them out of the business so we have a a better story of your business. Okay, so that I, I think that's that's all I, I want to talk about. But it is a big issue. It does have to do with your books and records. So if that's holding you back, you really have to. There's no way to successfully grow a business. And I mean growing a, a good business without having people look at your books and records. And I'm not talking about the IRS. <laughs> I'm talking about your financial mastermind. And we're going to get to that in the last chapter. So now we're going to cover, and I, I have a whole chapter, I have a whole course on payroll because it's so big. But I'm going to cover a few of the main issues. And you can see that it's payroll compliance and subcontractors. So payroll is the one area that I found gets the most businesses in trouble. I've seen payroll compliance issues put people out of business. Early in my career, I had the first experience. I had this car rent. It, I think it was a thrifty car rental that they did a lot of business. They were by the airport. And what this gentleman did, and this was back in the day when you can get away with a lot of stuff, what he did was he paid all his workers in cash when they worked overtime. So what happened with that was he must have had 40 or 50 employees. So he was doing a lot of business. What happened with that is he fired somebody. The guy got pissed off, went to the Department of Labor, Okay, and said, oh, I never got paid for my overtime. They came in, did an audit, and lo and behold, they, you know, there were no records that he paid these people for overtime. Long story short, he had to pay them again. Not only did he have to pay them, he had to refile all of his payroll tax returns and pay all the back taxes plus interest and penalties, plus... He probably had to go to his insurance company, and I, and I don't remember. Uh, I was just a junior accountant back then, but it was it was mind-boggling. This almost put him out of business, all because he thought he was saving a little bit of money. Okay, and in today's world, that is totally a no-no. They can find you a million different ways. People. They, all you need is one disgruntled employee. Okay, so this is what you have to, when you set up a payroll, this is what you have to do correctly. And I don't recommend anybody do this themselves. You need either an accountant, a bookkeeper, or a payroll company that will set this up correctly. You have to obviously register correctly. Not everybody does that. Just because you incorporate doesn't mean that you're registered with your state. 
Okay, and even if you're registered with your state, you got to make sure that you're registered with the State Department of Labor because in a lot of states, they're separate. The, the State Income Tax Bureau is different from the State Department of Labor. The State's Department of Labor handles unemployment insurance. Now, I don't know if you're aware of this, but this government has a huge unemployment problem, hence more compliance issues. They need the money, and they're going after small businesses for it. Another area is employee and employer documentation. All of those forms, and we're going to go through them, that used to be optional, like the W-4, they're not optional anymore. Okay, obviously payroll compliance means that once you're registered, you need to stay in compliance. Even if you have no payroll, you still got to file those payroll tax returns. They don't know, and they meaning the government, they don't know that you have no payroll. So what happens is if you have no payroll, they're going to send you a bill. They don't send you a notice anymore saying, hey, you forgot to file your return. They're going to send you a big bill. And independent contractors is another huge issue because one reason, Social Security. Okay, when you have, if you don't know what the difference between an employee and an independent contractor is, you, you're going to have to find out very quickly. There is a, a question on everybody's tax return now, including even if you're uh, in real estate, I just did somebody's tax return yesterday, and they have this question on the Schedule A. Have you paid anybody that requires a 1099 form? So employees get W-2s, and independent contractors get 1099s. That was never a question on a tax return. So now if you don't answer that, or you answer no, and you were supposed to, and almost all businesses have to file some form of 1099. Even if you're paying your accountant, your accountant is supposed to get a 1099. If you're paying a graphic designer, they're supposed to get a 1099. So almost every business is required to file a 1099. So if you answer that no, that is a civil penalty. And they are going to go after you. And it's very simple. You see, now because of technology, it's very simple for them to police us. All they have to do is look on your tax return, and if they see professional fees or something that looks like you should have been filing a 1099, instant audit. And when I say audit, it doesn't have to be somebody comes down and says, I want to see your books and records. They, they do what they call a desk audit or an electronic audit. They just have a programmer, and this is how audits are being done now. They just have a clever programmer say, let's match up this question with, with this tax line. And they spit out an answer, and they say, oh, this guy's got $3 million worth of uh, 1099s. He forgot to file. Now, the issue is that those independent contractors, they are notorious for not filing tax returns. And if they're not filing tax returns, not only aren't they paying income taxes, they're not paying Social Security taxes. Newsflash, Social Security is in trouble. They want their money, and they're going after it. And it used to be that corporations weren't required to file. If you paid a corporation, you didn't have to give that Part that corporation a 1099. That's not the case anymore. You pay a corporation, you still have to file a 1099. So if you're doing business, you might see a lot of requests for this form, W-9 form, request for taxpayer identification number. I'm getting bombarded with these because my clients don't know how to fill out the name, address, and tax ID number. What they do is they say, oh, here's a tax form. Can you fill it out for me? Okay. So everybody is, I just, I, I'm writing a book, and you, you know her, probably 
Susie Pruden is starting, well, not all of you know her because not everybody's in our, in our mastermind in this course, but Susie Pruden started a company called the Itty Bitty Book Company, and I'm writing a book. Well, last night, I got a, a W-9 form from her because guess what? If I'm lucky enough to sell books, I'm going to get royalties. This is September. This isn't tax season. That's what people usually send the request out. You can't do that anymore. So get familiar with the, 10, the W-9 form. Keep these in your electronic, your paperless file system, and have your, you're going to have tons of these if you're in business. And remember, you hire a lawyer, you hire an accountant. Get these before you pay them. Because if you're going to go after these people after you pay them, your chances of getting it is close to nil. Form 1099 is the form that you got to fill out at the end of the year reporting all the money you paid them. Okay, now here's a form that I recommend you get if you're doing business regularly. Now, th this form I-9 this has to do with 9-11, believe it or not. They are double-checking everybody, and they want to make sure not only that you got a tax ID number, but that you're actually legal to work here. Anybody can come up with a tax ID number and a Social Security card. A lot of those are phony, believe it or not. So now this form, if you look at it, they want a photo ID, they want a driver's license, they want your, your firstborn child, okay? And guess what? This isn't an IRS form. This is a Department of Homeland Security form. So do you think they're serious about this? I have already had clients get visited by Homeland Security, and guess what they wanted to say? They wanted to see all of their employee folders. Now, luckily, my clients listened to me, and they had all of the documents. Had they not had the documents, a whole avalanche of bad things would have happened. Not only would they have gotten fines and penalties for not having those, that would have triggered a, a, a Department of Labor audit, an IRS audit. Believe me, uh, it would have probably made me a rich man because I would have had to defend them on, on all of this. So now, some of the payroll registration forms, when you set up a business and you have to open up a bank account, I don't care if you're incorporated, not incorporated, you have to get a separate federal tax ID number. And you just go to the IRS, now you get instant gratification, uh, it's instant, you get a federal tax ID number, and guess what? When you're doing that, there's a question about when will you be hiring employees. It's not if, it's when. Okay. Now, unless you're a sole proprietor, and I don't recommend anybody do business as a sole proprietor, if you're a corporation or an LLC or a partnership, they want to know when you're going to have payroll. Reason being, now even if you're a sole shareholder of a corporation, the reason is, and they tell you this when, when you get all that junk mail, that at least one person has to be working for the corporation. Who's running it? Okay, again, people used to get away with opening up an S-Corp and never having payroll because they're not paying the payroll taxes. Guess what taxes they're not paying? They're not paying Social Security, and they're not paying unemployment insurance. They don't like that. So if you're going to be filing a return after a couple of years and there's no salaries, I guarantee you will be audited. It's not, it used to be, oh, you're playing the, the old roulette game, if I get audited. Okay, and the W-4 form used to be optional. It is not optional anymore. Okay, I hope that I'm getting through to you as to the, the serious nature of, of these documents. The, these are not optional anymore. 
Now, in my business, I'll tell you how, how serious this is. I used to specialize in handling tax problems. I stopped doing that because I got jaded because it seemed like everybody's tax problem, and I'm talking about you know, all kinds of corporate and individual audits, office and compromise, uh, payment arrangements. It was sort of like being a divorce lawyer. I was mired in everybody else's misery, so I stopped doing that. But in today's world, so many people are getting in trouble. Uh, I have decided to start handling tax problems again. Okay, it is, it's great for my business, I, and I am going to help a lot of people. It's not about being, a, everybody's getting in trouble now. Even if you're trying to do the right thing, uh, you have no choice but to get in trouble. Business is fluid. People make mistakes. You know, people forget to file a form. Okay, so I, I have a talent, and I have a lot of experience for fixing those problems. Now, these are some of the forms that have to be filed. I don't recommend anybody file these themselves, but just so you're aware of the Form 941, if you have workers' comp insurance, you're going to get requests, oh, I need Form 941. Now, you could take the approach of, I'll just call my accountant, or you can have a good paperless file system and have all these at your fingertips. Okay. When I run my business and I get a call from a client and I have to retrieve these documents, that goes in, into my time factor. Okay, The more time i got to spend, the more my client's going to have to be charged. I don't like that, but i got to get paid for my time. I can't spend my time for free. So keep that in mind. Okay, The other documents that you got to be aware of are anything relating to insurance. You're not going to have payroll without having any kind of insurance. Now, there are exceptions if you're a small business in New York State. You can opt out of having workers' comp and disability. But again, you've got to file forms and have that on record. I have a guy right now. He's not a client. He came as a recommendation. And he's got a $40,000 penalty because he was actually a sole proprietor. He had insurance because he had employees. He went out of business, but he never canceled his workers' comp. And Oh, actually, he did cancel, but what happened was he never excluded himself. Okay, and they came back to him and said, oh, you never excluded yourself, so you've got to pay us penalties. Not good. Okay, and a lot of this has to do with AIG, believe it or not. When AIG went under and the government decided to become their partner, AIG was the biggest carrier of workers' comp. Insurance companies, when they they wrote workers' comp policies, they dished that off to AIG. So there's a ripple effect. You got workers' comp, not only are they uh, adamant about enforcing the workers' comp, but they're looking at the job classifications. So be careful when you classify workers. If you tell a the your insurance broker that somebody's a clerical and you're paying you know, three cents for every hundred dollars. Because if you're a clerical worker, you know, the chances are that you're going to get a paper cut and go out on workers' comp are, are slim. But if that person isn't in the office and they're out in the field, let's say doing construction, you're going to get bagged. They're going to come into your office and say, where is Joe? He's down here as a clerical. Where if he's not in the office, they're changing his classification. Okay, chapter nine. And I know you know I'm going fast here, and that's one of the reasons why I record this, and that's why I give you a nice big ebook, and that's why I give you some free time with me after the course to discuss this. I had a student last night ask me if I can condense all this. And, and it's not just, this is a student that's learning to be a bookkeeper. So it's not just this course, there's three others 
plus we, we go through the business of bookkeeping, and I do that in 30 days. She asked me last night if I can condense it all into a week. <laughs> I used to do this in six months, and you know I was told through my mastermind that nobody's going to sign up for a six-month course. Uh, so that's why I go through a lot of this quickly. I don't expect anybody to really get all of this on the first round. If you get all this on the first round, you probably got an IQ of like 150, and you could probably teach me this stuff. So, anyway, Chapter 9, we're going to talk about QuickBooks, Excel, and other quick bookkeeping alternatives. Because guess what? QuickBooks is not the only way you can do books. What I found out is out of the 28 million businesses that are out there, so many of them have very few transactions, especially if you're a startup. So I get a lot of people, even when they're starting up, tell me they want to learn QuickBooks. And my question is why? If you, got, if you have less than 20 transactions a month, there's no reason why you need QuickBooks. Okay, now you can use, and again, you know, if they want to invoice or they want to do this or they want to do that, uh, there's so many other options out there for free. QuickBooks isn't cheap anymore. I think it costs 600 bucks for a single user version. Maybe even if it's 200, it, it doesn't matter. I think I pay 1200, but I got the ultimate version, but it's like killing a fly with a sledgehammer. So you don't always need QuickBooks. Okay, if you remember from the first couple of chapters, I showed you how to keep your books very simply with a pencil and paper. That being said, <laughs> let me take you through some of the QuickBooks options because I know I've learned that no matter how much I tell people they don't need QuickBooks, a lot of people already have started with QuickBooks. So if you remember in the first couple of chapters, we had what I call the chart of accounts. And this is, okay, so let me also preface this by, by saying that I actually have two other courses just for QuickBooks. So I am only going to touch on these things. I'm going to go quickly, and I'm not going to explain them in detail. When I do my QuickBooks course, I'm actually going to have QuickBooks open and show you in real time you know, how this is done. But at least if you're only taking this class and you do have QuickBooks, I thought it would be appropriate to at least show you some of the fundamentals of using QuickBooks. So right here on the list is where you go to the chart of accounts. Okay, and here on the right is a chart. I hope that you can see that if it's clear. But all this is is, you know, showing you what it looks like and how you can open up one of the one of the accounts. This is how you set up a an, a new account. Okay, you just go to down here. There's a couple of ways to start up to enter, create a new account. You can hit this account button, and up here it says no, and it takes you to this screen, and then you pick what type of account. Now, remember when I, I mentioned that there were only a few categories and a few subcategories. So these are the two main categories for a profit and loss statement, just simply income and expense. And down here, you got a, the, a couple of asset and liability items. Because of the nature of QuickBooks, this is how you have to set up your, your, your chart of accounts. And on the right is the actual screen. So if you pick expenses, this is what's going to come up. So I use account numbers. If you looked at the sample chart, you'll see numbers there. So I have a numbering system, and then I choose the account name. And then remember when I talked about the sub-account, so you can have cash in bank, and let's say you have two or three bank accounts, you would pick sub-account. 
So here is where this is an account. I hope nobody gets bad debts. Auto lease. So you can see auto lease is a sub account of auto expenses. And this is where, so you could see over here it's it's added. And now I'm going to go into how you write checks. So again, up on the top menu bar, you have banking. Now, one of the things I want to show you about QuickBooks is there's a lot of different options here, and most of them you don't need. When I go into my QuickBooks course, I'm going to, a lot of what I show you is what to avoid in QuickBooks. So when I go to write checks, Voila, a check comes up. And this is another one of the dangers of QuickBooks because it looks so simple. <laughs> okay? It looks like a check. That doesn't look like, you know, the ledger that, that I, I create when I did a real bookkeeping system. Okay, so you can imagine if you don't know anything about bookkeeping and you open up QuickBooks and you're like, oh, let me just, this is simple. Let, I can just start adding checks. Now, if you don't know anything about a chart of accounts and a balance sheet, the, these checks go into a black hole. They go anywhere. So you could see over here, I have, okay, so I'm going to print this so the, the check number will come out later. Or I can have it open and, and add a check number. Put the check number in there. But you could see that I have those few items that, that I told you you need. I have the date. I have the payee here. I have the account. Is this operating account? I have what account it's being posted to down here, purchase. And I have the amount. That's all you need to record a transaction. Now, here are deposits. Now, the, the deposit screen comes up from the same screen as the, as the checks. Okay, so down here are make deposits. And again, over here, I have the account, the date, who it's coming from, what category it goes to. Okay, other bookkeeping alternatives. In today's world, we, we still have the good old pencil and paper, and believe it or not, I have clients that are small, and they give me a handwritten P&L at the end of the year, and that's all I need. They have a couple of transactions a month. They total it up, and they give it to me like this, and that's perfectly fine. They are small. They're never going to grow. They are side businesses, and that works. Now, if you get a little bit larger, if you have, let's say, between 5 and 20 transactions, you can do your bookkeeping on a spreadsheet program. In fact, I'm working on a a spreadsheet that I'm going to share with you as soon as I'm finished with it. It's a simple, you know, it's going to have all the totals in there, you have boxes for you to put your categories. It's going to flow over into a, a simple general ledger, which keeps all your monthly totals. And that, the general ledger is going to flow into a trial balance, which we're going to cover. Okay, there's a couple of other online bookkeeping programs that are very inexpensive. I QuickBooks Online is not the same as QuickBooks for your desktop and it used to be very uh, it was terrible. I've heard through the grapevine that it's gotten a lot better but it's not free. <laughs> you still gotta pay for it. Okay and it, it's a lot less expensive than the desktop version. Now, I came across this program through one of my students here, Donna, uh, 
called Wave. And what it was was a, it was like QuickBooks was when it first started. Okay, it just gave you the basics. It gave it gives you the ability to record a check. Okay, it gives you the ability to make a deposit, and it's got a, a lot of other really cool features. Like you could take a picture of a receipt and upload it right to your your account. So that whole paperless file system, it's done seamlessly. So not only does it go into your your books so that you can view it later on it's going to go in the into the category so you don't even have to enter it and wave is free not only is it free you can you can share it with your accountant okay there's another program out there that one of my friends, Debbie Morgan, says she can't stand one of her clients use it. It's, it's called Zero. Now, I haven't used it, but from what I saw, the, the features look pretty, pretty nice. And it was pretty reasonable. I think it was like $30 a month. So those are some of your alternatives. And, and that brings us to Chapter 10. Now, this is where we're going to tie it all together from the initial transaction because this is the goal. Everybody has to file a tax return. And I'm going to take you through the whole process which we've already gone through. And the process should be what we call an audit trail. You should, your books and records should have what we call an audit trail. And what that means is that it's sort of like a breadcrumb trail. So if I look at a figure on your tax return, I can look back on your on your financial reports and see it. Then from your financial reports, I can see that on your trial balance, all the way back to the original transaction, and you and you have a document for that transaction. These are the tax returns that have to be filed. So if you're a sole proprietor, you're going to fill out a Schedule C on your, on your personal tax return. If you're a partnership, you're going to fill out a 1065. I don't recommend either of these for a business. Okay? Unless if you're a very small business, you, you want to be a Schedule C, but the problem with that is if you, let me tell you quickly what the problem with the Schedule C is. If you have a $10,000 profit, you're going to pay about $1,200 in Social Security tax. If you're an S Corp, you pay nothing in Social Security tax. I don't know how much longer that's going to be true. Okay? But... You know, if you're making five, ten thousand dollars a year, you know, I have no problem handling a client uh, to do that and and you know not have a payroll. Okay, that might seem hypocritical from what I said before, but I'm talking about very, very low income levels. Okay, so we talked about. The, the trail. Okay, so you're going to go from your tax return, and, and now I'm working it backwards. Okay, the balance sheet and the income statement are used to go into the tax return. The tax return, the financial statements come from what we call a trial balance. Okay, so your trial balance is really a balance sheet and income statement all on, on one report. Now, I want to caution you here. This is the trial balance. So you'll see we have all the categories. Word of caution, if you're doing your own books and you're beyond being a very small business, there's a, a small step here that you need, and that's an accountant. Because the accountant is going to make what we call journal entries to make sure that you're getting 
the maximum tax benefits. Okay, so people have a way of forgetting stuff or not knowing what kind of depreciation they should be taking. Okay, so I'm going to take you quickly through that whole process again from the handshake. The handshake is when we decide to do business with somebody. We do the transaction. Transaction gets recorded in a journal. That journal gets summarized into your general ledger, which is a summary of your business transactions. We take the totals from the general ledger and we make another summary, a more condensed summary, which is the unadjusted trial balance. You get a good accountant, they make adjustments, and you get the final trial balance. trial balance goes into your balance sheet and your income statement and that goes on your tax return. Now if you're unfortunate and this happens, this is what you do. You just contact me. <laughs> I got a call yesterday from a friend that I, I went to a, an event over the summer. Joe, I just got audited. What do I do? Okay, I referred him to my friend Debbie Morgan because she's close to him. And, you know, the idea was he thought I could tell him what to do. And it's not possible. Okay, you can't teach somebody how to handle a tax audit. So we're, we're almost done. You know, I know it's 12.01, but we got about three more minutes that I want to touch on something couple of issues very quickly. Uh, so I, I deal with a lot of startups and this is what I find. You can't have a business if you don't have revenue. I have seen way too many people try to start businesses and go on for years and never produce enough revenue to pay the expenses. Well, guess what? Either you have a hobby or you need to, to get a job or go on to another business. So, the, you know, you got to look at your business and say, do I have a product or service that people are going to actually pay me for? Okay, the legal and tax structure. Okay, you got to make sure that you're structured properly. You have to keep records. Payroll tax compliance, I talked about how important that was. And last but not least, the biggest issue facing a small business, uh, small business's success is the owner and his ego, his or her ego. Okay? A, a, a successful business person has some humility, lets people in, okay? And creates what I'm going to talk about here in Chapter 12, what I call the financial success mindset. Okay, you need to have a team. You need to have, if you can be your own bookkeeper, but you need the guidance of a good accountant, not just a good accountant, a good small business accountant. Okay, you need to make sure you're taking advantage of all your tax savings. You know, when you start up a business, believe it or not, you have expenses. And if you have started a business where you're still, when you're still working, and a lot of people do that, you have business expenses that you can write off against that ordinary income and lower your tax burden. Okay, now you can't just keep having expenses and write it off. The IRS doesn't like that. But for the first couple of years, you can absolutely take those deductions. Okay. Another thing that I employ is when you have a business that becomes profitable, you might want to set up other entities with different tax years. You might want to set up a consulting company to offset your brick and mortar business with a different tax year. All perfectly legal. Okay. You got to make sure that there's a business purpose. 
okay? But these are some of the strategies that you can employ. You know, we always heard, you always hear about the, t the benefits of owning your own business, okay? And too many times I've seen people, you know, start a business saying, oh, I'm going to get all the tax write-offs and not take advantage of all the tax write-offs that they can. Okay, and the reason is because they don't let the right people in. Okay, so that wraps up this course, Do-It-Yourself Bookkeeping. Okay, I hope that you've enjoyed this as much as me. And like I said, you can always, I encourage you to schedule that, that half hour of time with me by going to time with Joe. It's automatic. Once you schedule the time, it goes right to my email. I'll confirm it. It's a good system. And obviously you can you can email me and you know my the goal here was not to just spend this time with you, but the goal really is to teach you these fundamentals so that you might have a chance to be successful in your business. All right. So that's that's it. I'm going to sign off now, over and out. I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you.